on KGW News. It's been one year since the first case of COVID-19 showed up in Oregon. It was like, wow, this is actually, this is really happening. It's here, you know, it's not just, you can't contain it. We talked to some of the doctors and nurses who treated that first patient. Plus, the struggle is real. They're doing more than disappointing right now. They're frustrating everybody. Seniors fight again to get through online to book a vaccine appointment. And Oregon Republicans don't show up to work today in protest of the governor's COVID restrictions. We begin tonight with breaking news in Northeast Portland. Multiple people have been shot near 66th and Halsey. This is video just in from the scene. Police have more than 20 teams out helping in this investigation right now, but they're not releasing many details. A neighbor told our photographer he heard a series of gunshots and saw one person down. We're working to learn how serious the injuries are and just what led up to the gunfire. We'll keep you updated on KGW.com and our social media pages. And we just got new information on a situation that shut down I-5 near the interstate bridge this evening. This was the scene in Vancouver just before four o'clock when police arrested a suspect accused of stealing a FedEx truck at Knife Point. The man took off in the truck and was spotted on the I-5 bridge, and that's where officers caught up with him and took him into custody. No one was hurt. There are new developments tonight in the vaccine rollout. Clark County health officials say they're not getting their fair share of doses. And here's how Governor Jay Inslee explained the disparity when asked today. There's apparently a problem that the the county didn't feel they were equipped to receive the Pfizer, as I understand it, vaccine, which required up till now a very cold uh, chain storage system. And because people were not equipped to accept or would not accept that vaccine, this has been an issue. So we have tried to help the county by getting them more storage facilities. But here's the thing, Clark County health officials told us that doesn't explain the big discrepancy. A spokeswoman said tonight Clark County providers have the ability to receive, store, and administer Pfizer vaccine. Our large, largest health care providers have been requesting Pfizer vaccine for several weeks. Some had requests that were only partially filled or not filled at all. Additionally, some of our local providers were previously ordering Moderna, and those orders were not being filled without any explanation why. Governor Inslee says state officials are working to fix the issue. We'll continue to press for answers. Governor Inslee also announced today a pause on reopening for all Washington counties while health officials track COVID trends. The entire state is in phase two of reopening and has been seeing a decreasing trend in both case rates and hospital admissions. This graph shows just how much daily cases have dropped. It's steep in the state as a whole. Oh, it was another frustrating day for Portland area seniors trying to sign up for the vaccine. New slots open at nine o'clock this morning and were gone very quickly. Legacy changed its website to only allow so many people in at a time. So now instead of getting all the way through the process and then finding out you can't get an appointment, you should get a screen that says their site is busy. Legacy estimates there are currently 230,000 people in the Portland area eligible for vaccines who still do not have an appointment. And this coming Monday, the governor plans to add another 258,000 people, 65 and older statewide, to the eligibility pool. That includes Joe Levy. I think about these people who are 80 plus who haven't been able to get a vaccine and I think the more we add in these people, the harder it's going to get. And it's just, it's such a circus. It's, it's, I, I feel badly for the people who more desperately need it than I do, actually. Joe is one of many who think the governor should pause eligibility and not add any more groups to the mix until more seniors get their shots. Governor Brown extended the pandemic state of emergency today, and that allows for her executive orders regarding COVID restrictions to continue. The move, among other things, had Republican senators staging another walkout at the state capitol. I have been informed, Madam Secretary, that the Republicans will not be coming to the floor. I did not expect this. I was not notified of it. 
That announcement was from Senate President Peter Courtney today. Our Dan Haggerty is digging deeper into what was behind the move. Yeah, you almost thought to yourself, was that clip from last year or, or maybe the year before? And then you remember Senator Courtney was wearing a mask in it. And you're thinking, yeah, that, that did just happen today. So, yes, Senate Republicans walked out today for the fourth time in three years. And no, it is not over cap and trade this time. It's because the governor extended her COVID-19 emergency declaration, which has been in place, as you know, since last March. They released this statement saying today Senate Republicans are protesting in solidarity with students who want to get back into the classroom with seniors who are being failed by the vaccine rollout and with working Oregonians who are struggling to make ends meet. They also said they want the governor to immediately reopen schools, which we should note she's been saying for some time that it's a priority for her. After all, she did uh, she did put teachers ahead of seniors in the vaccine line. But Republicans say that she has the power to order them to reopen right now instead of waiting for the districts to decide. They also want more seniors to get vaccinated and allow more businesses to reopen. So we reached out to the governor's office who gave us a very statementy type of statement today saying Governor Brown is using all available tools and resources to respond to the crisis facing Oregonians, which includes getting students back into class, vaccinating seniors and focusing on economic recovery. They also threw a little shade and said Governor Brown is going to keep going to work every day for Oregonians. She expects all other elected officials to do the same. Now, what's not clear here is if this protest is just like a one day thing or if it's going to continue, uh, if they're going to not show up tomorrow. We don't know that just yet. The Senate was going through uh, some bills today. They were reading through those and referring them to committees. And every day is important. But this was kind of a day where what happened with this walkout, it wasn't a major disruption. But if the walkout continues, it could cause some real problems moving forward because there are hundreds of bills to get through this session. And if you're thinking, this is like deja vu all over again. Uh, it kind of is, but not really. The other three walkouts were a tactic to stop actual votes. This is more of a boycott. As a reminder, last year the Republicans walked out over cap and trade and effectively ended the session and nothing really passed at all, just a few things. They argued that Democrats were trying to rush that huge bill through during a short session, which is just 35 days, which is a good point considering the short session wasn't really designed for that sort of work. But that argument rather ignored recent history, considering they also walked out the year prior during a full session. In fact, Republicans walked out twice in 2019, first over public school funding, which ended up passing after they did make a deal to come back with Democrats, and again over the first version of cap and trade. And that's when we got this infamous soundbite from Senator Brian Boquist after Governor Brown threatened to send the state police to bring Republicans back to work. Send bachelors and come heavily armed. I'm not gonna be a political prisoner in the state of Oregon. That didn't go over so well, uh, in case you were wondering, but this has obviously become a new favorite tactic for Republicans. And it really boils down to the fact that they just don't have any sort of majority in Oregon's government. So for them and for the people they represent, they feel this is the only way they can get what they want or to stop something that they don't want to happen. Aside from trying to get more Republicans elected, which really doesn't help them in this situation right now. So we're gonna have to wait to see if today's walkout continues tomorrow. In the meantime, we'll keep you posted. Tonight, counselors and coaches are encouraging people to check in with the teens in their lives. It comes as a Lake Ridge High School football player died unexpectedly this week, prompting a renewed focus on suicide prevention. Katherine Cook reports. The news came like a gut punch. 15-year-old Ezekiel Crowder, a Lake Ridge High School sophomore, died by suicide Monday. On Facebook, Ezekiel's father, John Crowder, described his son as a humble, kind peacemaker, loved by all who knew him with a depth and character beyond his years. Zeke, as friends called him, also played football at Lake Ridge. Oregonian sports columnist John Canzano wrote about the loss. He hopes shining a light on it will help others who may be struggling in the dark. This kid was joyful by all appearances and smiling and happy and and, and, you know, had friends. And it, so it's everything sort of that we that we don't think about when we see somebody struggling as a community. We've got to ask each other more than just how are you doing? We have to ask the follow up question. We have to be journalists in our own lives. And 
and ask our loved ones and our neighbors and our friends like how they're really doing and then listen. I believe that the most important message that John gave was a message of hope. Emily Moser is the Youth Line Program Director at Lines for Life, a suicide prevention hotline. She says call volume since the pandemic has been up, with most teens seeking help for loneliness, isolation, and COVID fatigue. Sometimes uh, young people are calling a about their own parents and uh, worried about them as well. But when it comes to calls centered on actual thoughts of suicide, Moser says those numbers are not up. That reflects data just released by the state. It shows deaths by suicide went down last year from 910 in 2019 to 820 deaths in 2020. But at the same time, Uh, we're still struggling with all of these issues around connectedness and loneliness and isolation. Uh, And it's just getting harder because this goes on and on and on. I've got three daughters in my household and I can't help but relate to that. We all know that uh, this is a tough time and people are struggling. Kenzano hopes this latest loss will only strengthen communities resolve to draw closer together. He says that's already true for Ezekiel's teammates. They are now breaking every huddle, not with team or let's go or any of that stuff that we used to do in in our high school huddles, but they're breaking it by telling each other that they love each other. Ezekiel's father posted that his son's celebration of life will be this Saturday at Rolling Hills Community Church in Tualatin at one o'clock. The public is welcome. Catherine Cook, KGW News and our prayers to Ezekiel's family and friends. And we want to make sure you know help is available 24 hours a day. The number is 1-800-273-TALK, which is 8255. This is the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. It will connect you with local counselors anytime.